Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming this late. Uh, I'm Sunil. Uh, I'm a solutions architect with the deep learning team uh, at AWS. And I, I have uh, Vijay here, uh, who is the global head of AI at Visteon. Uh, we're going to be talking about deep learning for autonomous driving. Um, I'll go ahead and kind of set up, uh, go through, um, go to the overview of AI and automotive industry, talk a little bit about deep learning algorithms and why is deep learning important to autonomous vehicles. Uh, we'll then talk about what's the data pipeline look like, um, and then I'll hand over to uh, Vijay, who's going to talk more about advanced algorithms uh, that we can use in autonomous driving. Uh, so in particular, we'll talk about the use of reinforcement learning, uh, object detection, uh, maneuvers uh, for vehicles, uh, adaptive cruise control, uh, and we've got some fun demos lined up all throughout this uh, uh, session. Uh, we'll also do a simulation, and uh, we'll end with, uh, you know, how does the future look for autonomous uh, driving? So if you kind of look, about, uh, look uh, around uh, autonomous driving, so we can kind of uh, have two different uh, sections. One is the runtime environment, which I'll talk later. First one's the uh, development environment, right? So when you kind of think about uh, what's, what's needed, uh, you, have, you, you actually have to have terabyte scale acquisition, right? That's the, that's the main problem here. Um, and the next thing is, uh, you need to have HD maps. You, you, you can't rely on the GPS uh, or the maps that uh, we rely on as uh, drivers, right? Like uh, how many of you probably, all of us have probably experienced issues on uh, you know, the location. Uh, so what we need is centimeter precision uh, to guide the autonomous vehicle in the right direction. And then what we can have is localized, uh, we can uh, use localization to detect what's happening because you know, things can change. It, it's never uh, static. And then uh, we, we talk about um, you know, the, the use of machine learning, in particular convolutional neural networks that are, uh, um, that are using those. We have had state-of-art uh, results in uh, anything image-related these days. Um, and um, in the runtime, when we talk, uh, we, we, we have to think about vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, uh, of course, uh, with the use of HD maps, um, and then localization event processing. Each of these autonomous vehicles are loaded with a bunch of sensors. So having, having these sensors, kind of uh, a concept called the sensor fusion, where we get inputs from all these sensors, how do we make use of this collectively, right? So, so that's pretty important. And uh, we, need, we need edge computing. Uh, we can't rely on uh, network. Uh, first assumption in autonomous driving is network is never reliable, which, uh, pretty, which, which is pretty much a standard in any computing, I would say. Uh, but it's, it's, it's further more important because the impact can be uh, pretty catastrophic uh, in the autonomous driving setting. So, so having, an, uh, having uh, kind of a collaborative, what I like to term as collaborative computing, where uh, you do some part of the computing, on the, on the car or, the, uh, or in, at the edge, and then the other part, the heavy lifting, which can be done in the cloud, where we have in, uh, theoretically infinite scalability uh, to do uh, the task. But also, uh, we need to think about caching, right? Like in, in, the, in the sense that we need to have, we can't have load the entire map uh, of the world in, uh, uh, onto the car because uh, you know, it takes a lot of storage. So let's say I'm doing a drive from San Francisco to Las Vegas. Um, by the time I you know, sort of hit uh, I-5, uh, or depending on the route I take, um, get those maps as I get to the location. Also, there needs to be state management because uh, you can't just rely on completely uh, uh, reactive uh, to, uh, to the setting. You actually have to know uh, uh, what, what's been happening so far to make a more educated decision on what's happening. So, so we kind of talked about these requirements that we need for autonomous driving, and let's see how does AWS fit into picture here. So terabyte scale data acquisition. So we, we have products like um, 
S3, uh, services like S3, Glacier, where you can store data and archive, archive them. Uh, but sometimes when you think about the scale at which we operate uh, in an autonomous environment or these cars where we are recording video and tons of sensor data, this is a, a car can, uh, what we've seen is a car can almost accumulate up to 20 terabytes of data uh, in a day. And that's not maybe the best way to transport the data into the cloud. So what you need is uh, a cheap, faster way to get this uh, into, um, uh, into the cloud. So a snowball is a great way uh, to get data in uh, in a secure and cheap manner and really fast into S3. And then uh, we think about map creation, analytics, and that's where um, uh, Amazon Deep Learning and Machine Learning, uh, we did announce the service uh, SageMaker today, where you automate the entire training, uh, uh, go from development, training, and inference on AWS. And then people who want to be uh, at the bleeding edge uh, and really get the most out of the hardware or, some, uh, or, or uh, care about those uh, microseconds, that's when you get into uh, the hardware side. So, of course, we'll be training uh, these data sets, which uh, can't rely on just on CPUs. We use the GPU, uh, the P2 and P3 instances uh, to, to actually train uh, large data sets. Because uh, remember, we, uh, a single car, we're, we're talking about 20 terabytes of data that's being produced. So if you wanted to customize uh, your uh, hardware or uh, machine learning, uh, we can go to FPGA, use the VSDL, get really specific into uh, kind of the operators you want uh, to get this uh, to happen. Uh, and on the, on the autonomous driving side, uh, runtime side, uh, we have uh, CloudFront acceleration, so you can get data, uh, whether you're talking about getting data in really fast into, uh, into, your, into the car uh, or using S3 acceleration to ingest data, uh, incremental data into S3. Uh, of course, API Gateway and Lambda uh, gives you uh, the serverless capability to, uh, uh, for uh, any kind of, uh, maybe it's analytics dashboard or fringe activities that you want to actually have in the car. Uh, with Greengrass, you get the capability of deploying these serverless functions on to the edge. Now, this is actually great because you have a unified compute model now on the cloud and on the edge device. So when you have cloud connectivity, you can connect to the cloud and execute the Lambda function. If, when you're off, uh, for, off with connectivity, you can use these Lambda functions locally. Uh, with IoT, you can have a pub-sub mechanism uh, from your car to other devices or to the cloud or to your actual provider. Um, and IAM to uh, have a, a secure communication and manage policies, uh, whether it's data or roles. Now, let's look a little bit about what's uh, you know, AI and deep learning to do with autonomous vehicles. Uh, before that, let's do a little clarification of this AI, ML, DL uh, that gets thrown around a lot. The way I like to describe AI is the overarching term or the umbrella term that defines automation. Um, so if we think about human intelligence, tasks that require human intelligence, looking at to automate those tasks, and that's, that's what AI uh, stands for. Now, there are, a couple, there are many ways to get to an AI system, and one way is machine learning. So machine learning, uh, what, what we do is uh, we're trying to define a function that uh, fits the data, that understands this is the data distribution, uh, and we come up with an algorithm. And deep learning can be as, uh, described as a subset of uh, machine learning where we're defining a network structure which learns the parameters that is going to define or minimize the, the objective function that we have defined. Now, how does the AWS machine learning stack look like? 
So at the lowest level, we are looking at the framework and infrastructure side where uh, the, the latest and the greatest research and bleeding edge technology uh, is down there. So um, hardware, of course, we launched the C5 instances today, uh, but GPU instances uh, with a P3 uh, that uses the Volta chips. And uh, as far as my training experiments have gone, I've been able to get about uh, five to six X performance over the P2, the previous generation P2 instances uh, on computer vision related tasks. Um, the middle layer uh, is uh, perhaps the most important uh, after, the, after the bottom layer here uh, is you, once you get the data into the system, how do you model that data? How do we have a system or infrastructure that can scale and, and actually be able to handle the massive amounts of data, but in a more streamlined way? So that's why we announced Amazon SageMaker today, so that developers and data scientists can rely on uh, our infrastructure, where we do the heavy lifting in terms of provisioning and scaling, training, and inference uh, very easily where, on, where data scientists can collaborate and focus on what they do best is interpreting the data, defining algorithms, and not worrying about the infrastructure. And uh, of course, uh, for other things that might be interesting in a, in a connected car setting, using some of these vision and speech algorithms uh, where we have seen uh, a lot of, uh, like what BMW, um, has done with connected cars. Uh, we've also seen uh, people do integrations with Alexa. Um, and then uh, we now have the capability of uh, recognizing objects and doing uh, video and image analysis in the cloud uh, and being used and uh, exposed to you uh, developers as an API. Uh, you may think about, hey, I, I want to get started and see uh, to my, uh, get, get my hands dirty with data and see whether I can build some autonomous technology. So what I thought would be is cool to um, you know, give you a slide on various data sets that are available free where you can do, um, uh, we, where you can take these data sets, use some of the algorithms on SageMaker, and also uh, um, uh, you know, get, 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 your, get a feel, or maybe even build your own autonomous car, which I'll come to. Uh, so two uh, classification, one's object detection, uh, where uh, the Kitty benchmark data set, we have street signs, uh, city landscape data sets that are available. Um, and on the self-driving side, where there's track data from MIT, Oxford, um, and Thunder Hill uh, racetrack, where uh, we do a robocar. Um, at a rally. With, we, we talked a little bit about that massive data, uh, the, uh, to get, get massive data ingest into AWS. So the, one of the best way is uh, using Snowball Edge, which a lot of the autonomous uh, car um, uh, customers actually tend to use. So it's not just Snowball, uh, you could use Snowball Edge, where we actually have compute at the edge on Snowball, so you can use those Lambda Greengrass functions uh, to do compute as you're transporting, and pre uh, maybe you want to do some pre-processing, so you do that while you're transporting into AWS. But there are cases where this might not be enough, right? Like 100 terabytes, like that's five days worth of uh, data when you talk about autonomous cars, and maybe you have a bigger fleet. Um, you have Snowball, where you can get petabytes of data into uh, AWS. Uh, but there's another, uh, what I'd like to say is maybe you have incremental data that comes in and you want to ingest this pretty fast. So you can use S3 acceleration to ingest the data into AWS. What this does is it doesn't go to the endpoint. So let's say uh, you're uh, in, yeah, we're all in Vegas right now. Uh, so if we wanted to ingest here, the closest data center would be um, either, uh, it would probably be uh, in uh, US West 1 that is in Northern California. Now, instead, what we could do is uh, we could actually ingest the data in 
through the uh, uh, point of presence or cl through CloudFront where it might be faster to ingest that data. So this is the animation on uh, when, when you're not close to the region, operating close to the region, uh, this gives you a lot of benefit in terms of latency and getting that data into AWS. So, um, so we did a hackathon. We did a, for, for the first time, we did an autonomous car hackathon on Sunday and uh, Monday, uh, as a couple of days ago. Uh, so I wanted to show, share a couple of videos on uh, how and people, participants with no machine learning experience or even car building experience were able to build a car in the span of 14 hours and actually race it. So um, I wanted to show, um, they used a method called as behavioral cloning. Uh, the idea is you drive the car around, you collect a lot of data, and you, you learn how the driver drove and try to replicate or imitate that. Um, so let's, let's look at what, a, what the run looks like. And uh, that, that car, uh, those cars can be pretty fast, and uh, the car was, uh, here, uh, you can see, was able to do a successful lap and stay within. Uh, but one of the limitations here is, as I said, like it doesn't quite understand just um, uh, the, the objects or what the path is. It just knows that um, you have to stay between the lines uh, or learns how the driver drove, right? So theoretically, it drives worse than you did. <laughs> the way I like to say is the car's afraid of white lines and try, uh, tries to stay between those. So here's a classic case where it doesn't know about any objects. So, <laughs> so uh, all it knows is, well, that's something I, I don't need to hit, but it, it's not necessarily the correct maneuver that, that you want the car to do. So. <laughs> Um, so this was just uh, um, the race where we had uh, two teams that were, uh, that were pretty close. So the fastest, it was 111 feet track, and we had teams that did, uh, uh, the first team, uh, the top team uh, ended at 13.37 seconds, and the second team was 13.44. So they decided to actually go to a head-to-head -head race and see uh, what they do. Um, so let's actually watch and uh, see uh, who wins here. All right. I'm going to speed up in the interest of time. I should have actually taken bets on uh, which one's going to win, but. <laughs> So the red one clearly won. Uh, uh, it did well. Uh, but it, you see the problem here, right? Like, it, there is some inconsistency. What it's doing is uh, you're only learning its, its imitation behavior. It doesn't understand what's, what's in. It doesn't use any localized. It sort of uses only the image information, so very limited local information. Uh, so no, no HD maps here, uh, no additional sensory inputs <laughs> in to actually correct or course correct, right? So this is, uh, this is kind of the problem you have with just behavioral uh, cloning. Uh, so you need something more advanced and actually have more capabilities, uh, whether it's sensor fusion, HD maps, or better machine learning techniques. And that's why we, are, we have um, Vijay here from Bistian who's gonna talk more about these advanced techniques and how you can actually achieve a better driving than what we saw here. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Anil. Thanks, Vijay. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, before I get started, we have a quick show of hands. Uh, how many of you in the audience think that uh, uh, there'll be commercial autonomous cars on the market in, say, two or three years? Uh, how many of you think it'll take 10 years, uh, about evenly divided, maybe slightly more for two or three years. Uh, how many of you think it'll be never? 
We're a very positive crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and how many of you haven't heard a word about autonomous driving so far? There's always one, one wise guy. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, I'm actually quite honored that uh, you guys chose to come here instead of going for dinner. Uh, I think that means a lot. Uh, but uh, basically what I want is uh, to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what we are doing in the autonomous driving and also to uh, get into some detail about some of the newer technologies that are coming into the picture. And uh, one of them is reinforcement learning, but there are several more. And we're going to talk about one of them, reinforcement learning, in some detail today. Okay, but before I get into that, uh, very, very quickly, there are some, the, the, auto, the automotive industry is now undergoing some pretty transformative change. And uh, in many ways, uh, what's going to happen in the next 10 years will probably be uh, more profound than what happened in the last 100. Uh, and that's a fact. Uh, but it's not just in AI, it's not just in autonomous driving, it's in several different areas. Uh, one of them is electric vehicles. We are, they're all around us, and uh, the world is going more and more in that direction. Uh, that's not going to stop, the wave is just escalating. Uh, obviously, autonomous driving are dis uh, vehicles, uh, aut autonomous driving is disrupting the entire notion of uh, self driving. And uh, uh, the real question is. How soon will the, will the technology get perfected well enough, and how soon will the trust uh, build up among people like all of you and me? Uh, and finally, how soon will the regulations come uh, be uh, at a level where uh, vehicles on the road are essentially uh, there for all of us to drive comfortably? Uh, the third thing that's happening, which is uh, quite pervasive, is uh, AI and cloud connectivity. Uh, and the two, in some sense, are almost interlinked. You, almost, you, you can have AI without cloud. You can have cloud without AI. Cloud plus AI is uh, more than one plus one. It's like five. Uh, so you get a lot of benefits from cloud plus AI coming together. Uh, and that's only going to drive the whole industry. Uh, and finally, uh, what is happening in a big way in autonomous, uh, in, in automotive, is that uh, there is going to be, uh, that already is in some ways with Uber and Lyft, but now there's going to be much more uh, monetization of services. Uh, monetization of services in automotive has not really been all that, uh, uh, a concept that people have embraced very much, uh, but now that is coming more and more into the picture. Uh, so there are some certain building blocks of autonomous driving, uh, four to be precise, and on the one hand, uh, autonomous vehicles need to know, they need to have an awareness of what's around them, and that is through sensors effectively, uh, what we call sensor fusion. Uh, and that could be cameras, it could be LiDAR, it could be uh, uh, IMUs, uh, for example, accelerometers, gyroscopes, and such. Uh, the output from that goes into uh, a capability called object detection and classification, uh, where the vehicle literally uh, derives an awareness of its surroundings. That's the main ob uh, objective over there. And that's simply from looking at uh, camera images or from LiDAR images. And uh, the vehicle then gets an awareness of its environment, uh, such as other vehicles on the road, uh, could be the lane markings on the road, things like that. Uh, but once it knows that, uh, it, it cannot stop there, because that by itself doesn't help a lot. So what you need to do is uh, you need to essentially uh, have the vehicle know what to do with that information or with that awareness of its environment. And that gets into uh, vehicular maneuvers, uh, also called path planning, where the vehicle basically is uh, learning or understanding how to uh, essentially go from point A to point B by controlling certain actuators. There are specifically three of them that matter, steering, braking, and throttle control. And uh, uh, the path planning uses uh, a very different type of AI uh, that we call reinforcement learning. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. And then finally, of course, uh, what we have is actuator control, uh, which is uh, taking the output from the AI and applying it to the driver wire controls of the vehicle. Uh, so what is also happening in the whole AI evolution, uh, which is a, a bit of a, an interesting thing to reflect on now and then, is that uh, things are moving up the food chain. Uh, if you go way back, not even that way back, but say even three or four years back, almost every single thing used to be rule-based. So you had algorithms uh, which essentially said, that, okay, if certain things happen, then the vehicle will behave in a certain way, and it was very, very predictable. 
but not very good at handling complexity because uh, very soon you find that the number of permutations that a vehicle needs to handle just explodes. Uh, essentially get what, what is called combinatorial explosion and uh, uh, it's just very hard to uh, deal with that in software. Uh, so that's why that's where AI came in. And the first frontier of AI is basically uh, just to identify, just to understand, or uh, not understand, but to know what is in the scene in front. And that gets into uh, convolutional neural networks uh, and uh, the bounding boxes around the objects. I mean, that is exactly that. It is basically to understand or to identify what objects are there around a the vehicle. Once you identify the objects around a vehicle, uh, the next thing is to understand the meaning behind them. Uh, what do they signify? Uh, because now what you need is to start making decisions based on that knowledge. And the only thing that will facilitate that is an understanding of exactly what uh, the scenery is all about. And that gets into uh, what we call reinforcement learning. Uh, I'll cover that in some pretty good depth today. Uh, and then the frontier beyond that is, uh, again, one uh, a higher level, which is uh, reasoning. Uh, now, that's where it starts to approximate you know, the human intelligence. So it's not quite there yet. Uh, but uh, the step beyond that, too, which is uh, creativity. Uh, I, I didn't put that in the, in, in the slide. But the whole point here is that AI is moving up the food chain. And I think uh, what a lot of companies are doing, startups in particular, is essentially uh, following this trajectory up the food chain. Uh, so getting closer to autonomous driving, there are basically three technologies that are uh, front and center right now. Uh, and uh, neural networks, specifically CNNs or convolutional neural networks, they are in many ways the foundation of uh, autonomous driving. Without CNNs, uh, it's very hard to have uh, any, any good AI in, uh, in, a, in a car. Uh, and uh, there are many, many companies with some really brilliant designs and, and architectures that have uh, come up with really fantastic algorithms for this, where uh, they can uh, classify images with north of 99% accuracy uh, at a very, very high performance uh, in terms of frames per second, and also in terms of uh, uh, the absence of false negatives and false positives. So that is becoming, uh, I would say, a mature science, if you will. Uh, but there are two more areas which are now coming into the picture in uh, very profound ways. Uh, one is re reinforcement learning. And in reinforcement learning, the whole idea is to go from what used to be rule-based to something which is uh, essentially uh, AI-based. And uh, the way you do that is basically by uh, teaching the vehicle or having the vehicle learn how to behave uh, in certain environments by observing what is going on. And then it will change its... Uh, uh, behavior patterns or learn how to uh, essentially perform certain maneuvers better. Uh, and the third thing that uh, we uh, need to do there is basically uh, trajectory prediction. Uh, so for example, if there is a vehicle in the adjacent lane and that is going to cut in, uh, we would like to know that simply before it cuts in, we'd like to know from its behavior that it is probably going to cut in. And uh, that is essentially uh, using a technology called uh, recurrent neural networks, RNN. Uh, so here is why reinforcement learning matters. Uh, and the, there are, of course, several reasons for it. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's an evolving science, so it's not uh, as mature yet as it will be in, say, a year or two or five. Uh, but one of the things is that it allows uh, a very large number of maneuvers to be uh, implemented. Uh, it's almost boundless in some ways, but uh, it can learn. Uh, if you, you need to have the right model to train it. But once you have that right model, uh, then it can learn a pretty large number of maneuvers. Uh, the second thing that it shines at is complexity. So once you train uh, a reinforcement learning network, an RL network, uh, it can learn complex maneuvers, which uh, essentially can handle almost 15 to 20 different parameters. Obviously, uh, in some cases, the more parameters you have, the longer the training time will take. Uh, you don't necessarily need that many all the time, but uh, it can handle that. Uh, that is something which rule-based systems simply cannot deal with. You try to have 15 parameters, all of them uh, varying in some, to some degree. Uh, it's a very, very hard thing to do uh, using uh, rule-based. Uh, and the third thing that uh, an, an RL system can do is basically make decisions. 
Uh, so what does that mean? It essentially means you have uh, essentially an awareness of uh, the environment. Uh, you know how the environment is behaving. And then from that, you have basically learned what to do when the environment behaves in certain ways. And how do you learn? You learn by essentially making mistakes. So you make mistakes, you learn from making mistakes that doing certain things badly is a bad thing. You get uh, what is called a negative reward. I'll talk about that. Uh, but you also get positive rewards if you do things well. And that is, at a, at a very high level, that is fundamentally how reinforcement learning works. But it allows uh, the vehicle to make decisions, and that gets back to what I was talking about earlier. Uh, it is essentially understanding how to uh, make sense of uh, the environment, and then how to make decisions based on that. Uh, so these are a set of vehicular maneuvers, and there are many, there are many more that RL can handle. Uh, and people sometimes get very surprised when they see a list like this, but it is, it's true. Uh, I don't think anybody has implemented every single one of them, uh, at, as yet anyway. Uh, but uh, it shows the power of reinforcement learning. It has the potential to be a, a very, very powerful AI technology. And uh, right now, uh, many companies are doing the simpler functions, uh, such as adaptive cruise control, or lane keeping, or, uh, or maybe overtaking maneuvers, things like that. Uh, but from there, uh, once the companies have figured out how to do those well, then going from there to the next level uh, becomes an easier task. And that is the general trajectory or the general trend in the industry right now, or that will be the trend. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, in, in our case at Vistion, uh, we uh, essentially have focused initially on uh, adaptive cruise control and uh, the various forms of lane change, of which overtaking is one, but then there are others, such as the highway narrowing, or it could be the vehicle in stop and go congestion and needing to make a lane change to sort of break out of that congestion and go in the faster lane, uh, things like that. Uh, but uh, there are others that are uh, in the pike, and uh, uh, essentially what you will find is that uh, more and more companies will start to get into this, uh, and this will, in some ways, become a technology probably as profound as uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, so uh, what is the typical workflow of uh, any AI design, not just RL, but in general, any AI design in the automotive world? Uh, once you know what the algorithm does, how do you go from there to making it a commercial product? Uh, and it's typically not uh, something that is done uh, in, a, in a slow fashion. Uh, it usually is done uh, uh, fairly quickly by automotive standards anyway. In automotive terms, uh, cycles tend to be almost like five years. Uh, a lot of what we are seeing over here is essentially uh, getting implemented uh, very quickly. Uh, now, even there, once it's implemented, uh, the OEMs have to uh, make plans to put it in their vehicles, and that can take some time sometimes. Uh, but uh, the basic thing is you first begin with defining what maneuver or set of maneuvers you, know, you basically want to embrace. Uh, and then uh, you, design, you figure out uh, for each of those maneuvers what the RL model is. Uh, and that gets into uh, uh, you know, essentially uh, the parameters that are important for, uh, uh, you know, for uh, each maneuver. Uh, you take that and then you implement it on a simulator. Uh, sadly, uh, nobody is uh, willing to give us 10,000 cars to go on the highway and crash. Uh, so, uh, so simulators are the way to go. But uh, uh, they are actually extremely powerful, and they do actually give very good results very, very quickly. Uh, there are several of them in the market, almost like about five or six uh, really good ones. Uh, and once you have a simulation model implemented, the next thing beyond that is you want to really test it. Or maybe initially you test it on a model car, but really you want to test it on a real car before long. Uh, so that's what you do. Uh, and then uh, typically the real car won't be put on the real road right away. Uh, I mean, you could, but uh, I, would, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but you get it working in some closeted environment initially. Uh, and once it works reasonably well over there, uh, then you can go to the real road, like a highway or uh, the, the city streets, and then try it out over there. Uh, and once that works well, uh, the next step beyond that is, of course, to productize it. Uh, and that gets into basically uh, endless testing uh, with very high levels of, uh, I would say, unknowns thrown at the 
uh, at the object or at, at, the, at the car. Uh, unknowns being uh, uh, traffic scenarios that the vehicle may not necessarily be uh, aware of in terms of how to address, uh, how to handle. Okay, but that is basically the implementation workflow. Uh, so let me show you a video of how the overtaking maneuver works. This is obviously on a simulator, but it's the overtaking maneuver. I'll just let it pay through. We can read the captions. So obviously, this guy is doing a great job of overtaking, but he's doing a terrible job of uh, uh, illegal driving. <laughs> but nonetheless, it, it basically explains how a simulator is used. Uh, and uh, uh, what we do typically over here is, I'll get into this a little more later, but uh, we, this requires creation of many, many simulation vectors. And these simulation vectors uh, essentially are thrown at the RL model. Uh, you typically put some noise or variance around them, uh, so you can get uh, no, a whole bunch of different scenarios. But then through that, the RL system can actually train itself. Uh, and it's pretty amazing how, how quickly it does that. Uh, we are all used to thinking that uh, in AI in general, uh, all the data sets need to be huge and terabytes and petabytes and all that. For RL, that is typically not the case. You typically have uh, fairly constrained data sets. Uh, what you do need is uh, a certain degree of patience in refinement, uh, because uh, these things don't, get, don't necessarily always get trained or converge very, very quickly. Sometimes it takes uh, refinement of the model uh, quite a bit. Uh, and the first few models that one may put together may not even converge, and that's very frustrating. But once you sort of stay with it and figure out why it's not working, uh, you come up with a model that does work. And then once you have it working, then refining it from there becomes uh, a pretty easy charter. So this is another video. And uh, this is uh, basically uh, one of, uh, this is a video of uh, uh, a model car that we did uh, almost a year back now, or maybe a little more than that even. Oops. So a little bit like uh, the Robocar rally that uh, uh, Sunil was showing. So this car will never win any race at all. And uh, in fact, it's a big, slow, ugly turtle. Uh, but nonetheless, I think it does a pretty decent job of uh, staying within the lines. And that was our main objective there. Our, our objective was really for it to stay within its lines and also to recognize traffic signs. And this, so this dates back to 2016. OK. So now that we've talked a little bit about uh, the higher, no, I mean, the uh, that the fundamental uh, uh, about what RL is used for. Uh, let's dive a little deeper into the fundamentals of it. So now, uh, for the next few slides, I'll talk. It'll be a little technical, uh, but in reinforcement learning, uh, unlike neural networks, uh, there are, there are, the structure of an RL is very very different from the structure of a typical neural network. You can have a neural network inside an RL, but uh, it doesn't have to be always. It depends on what scenario you have. But there are basically five things that matter. Uh, one is the object of interest, or what we call the ego vehicle, so to speak, in, in, in the automotive world, is called the agent. Uh, whatever is around the vehicle, uh, which could be the vehicle ahead, it could be pedestrians, it could be you know, uh, other uh, uh, maybe, maybe buildings or traffic signs, uh, that is called the environment. Uh, what happens is the agent will observe the environment and then take certain actions uh, in response to what the environment is doing or in response to whatever its own purpose is. So it, it sort of figures out what the environment is doing, what it wants to do, and then take certain actions uh, and, and try to proceed along those lines. Uh, if those actions result in something which is good for the vehicle, then it gets a reward, which is called a positive reward. 
if those actions result in something which is bad for the vehicle, then uh, what happens is that uh, uh, it will result in a negative reward. And there is fundamentally a state transition model that, uh, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, uh, but the state transition model essentially helps the vehicle learn how to do it better the next time. And that, that state transition model uh, is improved with each iteration of rewards. Uh, so uh, now, uh, again, uh, there are simple scenarios. And I would say that adaptive cruise control is a simple scenario. You don't have very many parameters in that. Uh, you have basically the uh, velocity of the vehicle ahead, the ego vehicle's own velocity, uh, the distance between the two and not a whole lot more, uh, but you basically want, what you want to do there is essentially uh, follow a slower vehicle at a safe following distance. That's the main thing. So you have to essentially detect the vehicle ahead and then uh, t take certain actions, typically braking, and then uh, make sure that you brake enough or accelerate enough to stay at that safe following distance. Then there are uh, far more complex scenarios, uh, for example, making uh, a turn at an intersection, uh, especially if there's a traffic light over there. Now that uh, typically uh, would need to be decomposed into maybe two or three uh, no, sub-scenarios, and then you handle each sub-scenario separately. But not all scenarios will have the same level of complexity. And one of the key things to, uh, you know, to note is that uh, uh, one really needs to have a certain awareness of what the complexity is and have a model that will match that complexity. Having a model that is excessively complex uh, might be OK, and the RL will eventually figure out how to learn from that as well. But that lo whole learning process itself might take quite a long time. So it's better to simplify it and then have the, uh, the, the subordinate models or the, the, the sub-models uh, be trained, uh, and that can be done much faster. Uh, getting even more technical, uh, there is in uh, the RL parlance, there are certain terms. Uh, and. Uh, so there is basically uh, one term which is called the Markov decision process. Uh, so what is uh, a Markov decision process? Uh, it sounds like a very complex thing. And basically what it is, it's nothing more than a simple framework for essentially handling uh, you know, situations where, which are largely predictable but partly uh, unpredictable. Uh, so it, it essentially is a formalism for uh, being able to handle the unpredictability of certain scenarios. And that essentially is what characterizes uh, autonomous driving as well. Uh, you never have any situation where everything is completely and totally perfectly predictable. And a model that can allow uh, the system to uh, essentially, uh, I would say, uh, learn how to deal with that lack of predictability is a good model. Uh, to achieve that, there is another concept that is called the Q-table. Uh, a Q-table is basically a state transition table. It's a fancy name for a state transition table. Uh, and uh, what you have is essentially a set of states and a set of actions. And then, uh, and again, this is a very, very simple table. Most of the time, the states might be many more than this. It could be as many as 20 or 30 or 50 states in some cases, or even more. Uh, and then there are cases where there the, 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 the infinite number of states, and I'll, I'll get to that because that gets into you know, deep RL. But at a simpler level, uh, what happens here is that you detect what state the vehicle is in, and then you look at the Q table. Uh, the Q table for that particular row will have a certain number of entries. Uh, for example, here in state one, uh, if you look at it, uh, it basically shows three states. Action A is uh, 0.659, action B is 0.121, and action C is zero. So what you really want to do is find that entry which corresponds to the largest value and pick that as a state, uh, as the action that you'll perform. So in this case, if you were in state one, uh, you would essentially pick action A. Now, that is well and good, and that makes it like a completely predictable uh, no, uh, state transition table. Uh, the issue here is that uh, in the real world, uh, these states won't be perfectly predictable. So what we need to do is essentially uh, allow for a certain amount of lack of predictability in the, in the model. And that gets into, uh, I'll show this in the code later on, uh, but that gets basically into uh, you know, how you handle uh, you know, different states. Uh, so uh, I'll actually uh, not get too deep into this uh, because I 
running out of time here. Uh, but fundamentally, what we have is uh, essentially uh, a model for updating the weights or updating the entries in a queue table. And once you update the entries in the queue table, the queue table becomes much better. And then you can actually, uh, and I'll show this in the example that I have, but uh, the vehicle or whatever object you're trying to train for uh, performing certain actions will do that job much, much better. Uh, so there are many, many models in reinforcement learning. Uh, one pretty popular model is called the actor critic model. And in this model, uh, what you essentially have is a system. And usually what happens is that the system and the actor uh, or the agent uh, will interact very directly. So the system will often be called the environment. And the actor will typically be called the agent. And that is essentially a reward from the, from the system that goes, or from the environment that goes directly to the agent or actor. The actor knows how to deal with that reward. The actor critic model is a little different. Uh, and the reason it's different is because it is possible for the actor or the agent to be sometimes biased. They may not necessarily always make the best decisions based on the rewards that they get. They may uh, no, not like the rewards, and they may still keep doing the same thing. So the purpose of the critic, uh, and this again, there's a mathematical formalism for this, but at the intuitive level, the critic essentially gets the reward from the, uh, from the environment. Uh, the critic essentially is uh, able to uh, evaluate the reward and judge if uh, it is something that uh, the actor should be doing differently or not. And then it'll have a certain, uh, it'll essentially instruct the actor to do certain things differently. But the whole objective here is that, a, is that a critic is impartial, whereas the actor is a partial entity. Uh, and there's a mathematical formulation uh, around this. Uh, but essentially, uh, RL models that follow the actor-critic uh, formalism usually tend to converge very, very fast. And they end up with, uh, you end up with better RL models as a result. Uh, deep Q networks are basically there for uh, 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 fundamentally uh, addressing situations where you may not have a finite set of states. And typically, almost about 90 or 95% of situations fall in that category. So almost all of RL or most of RL typically would use a deep Q network. Uh, in a deep Q network, the whole idea is basically uh, to uh, uh, go from a, a few states which can be uh, represented with a Q table. Uh, in a deep Q network, you don't really have a Q table. You have essentially a, a, a neural network, which could be typically a CNN, but could sometimes be a, 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 a recurrent neural network as well, if you're doing some, uh, something uh, maybe that is sequential. Uh, but the idea here is to handle complexity of scenarios. And the deep Q network essentially allows that complexity of scenarios situation to be handled. Uh, and that essentially allows it to handle uh, many, uh, a, a much, much richer set of uh, uh, vehicular maneuvers than you could get from just a state transition table. Uh, so uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip past this. Uh, this presentation will be made available on GitHub. So uh, uh, you'll certainly have access to this if you need it. Uh, so how do you train an RL for, let's say, adaptive cruise control? So the basic idea here is uh, you'll have a simulator on which you create essentially hundreds of vectors. And uh, those vectors will basically uh, be imp uh, essentially be used to train the neural network. And then uh, what you basically do is you have the results or the actions uh, resulting in certain good outcomes and sometimes resulting in uh, suboptimal outcomes. And uh, the Good outcomes will essentially result in a positive reward. The suboptimal outcomes will result in a negative reward. Uh, but by repeating these uh, instances over and over again, the network starts to get much, much better. This is also a video. So this is actually uh, a negative reward. So that's not supposed to happen. OK, so now this is a little fun. Uh, this is actually a video that 
Uh, it's open source. It's on it's on YouTube, but uh, I just thought it was interesting to show. Uh, it is basically a video of uh, an of a car. If you can think of that, it's not really a spider. Looks like one, but it's basically a car with essentially five sensors, and uh, it is struggling mightily uh, to figure out what to do. But it's surprisingly getting better, if, if, even if it doesn't look like it. So now it has learned how to go around a track. And uh, actually, if you let it run for a long time, it goes very, very nicely. It, right now, it's still meandering a little bit as it goes around. But if you let it run for, uh, for a 1,000 loops or something like that, it gets very, very steady. OK, uh, so. Uh, where is RL headed? Uh, it's a fairly new technology. It's not been around for all that long, but uh, it's been around for maybe about two, two years at the most. Uh, it's progressing very, very rapidly. Uh, but essentially, what's going to happen in RL is uh, you'll see the industry going from the simple maneuvers, like adaptive cruise control or lane change maneuvers, to much more complex maneuvers. And you'll see many of those coming to the fore in the next two to three years. Uh, how does RL get better? Uh, there is a very interesting area of RL called adversarial reinforcement learning, where you essentially have uh, a good agent and you have a bad agent. It's intentionally bad. The job of the good agent is to essentially do its job properly. The job of the bad agent is to make sure that the good agent does not do its job properly. So it's like a dueling uh, kind of mechanism. And uh, they both get very, very good at uh, so the the good agent gets much, much better because that agent gets scenarios thrown at uh, no, on, on, on the highways, for example, or on, on the streets uh, of roadside situations that uh, it simply will not be able to create on its own. Uh, the bad agent gets uh, better because it figures out how the good agent has figured its earlier uh, impediments uh, very quickly, or it has figured them out, and now it tries to uh, tries to create much bigger impediments for the good agent to uh, try to overcome. So uh, by doing this, uh, essentially the good agent becomes not just good but extremely good. Uh, again, this is a fledgling technology right now, but the whole idea here is that you allow agents to duel, and by doing that, uh, the RL becomes very very good. Uh, it's not necessarily just that simple. Sometimes what you need to do is also include, increase the model as you know, as, as, as they get better. The model itself may have certain limitations sometimes. Uh, it's not just the scenarios. Uh, but anyway, adversarial RL is a big thing happening. And uh, uh, certainly in academia, this is a big area that's being uh, looked at right now. Uh, the third thing is that in RL, uh, what will happen is that uh, the cloud is going to p uh, play a, a much, much bigger role. It won't be the vehicle all by itself that, uh, that, that does this. Uh, the cloud will come into the picture. And the cloud uh, essentially can be the, uh, a, a repository of uh, uh, certain data, or it could be the repository of uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, certain triggers uh, that uh, could cause the, uh, I mean, the vehicle will need to react to those triggers. It could be uh, something as simple as a weather warning, or it could be you know, uh, something which uh, is uh, you know, perhaps uh, an ice slick on the road, uh, but the vehicle will need to react to that in some fashion. Uh, so the triggers will come from not just the road itself, uh, but also from the cloud. Uh, so that's what I have with this. And uh, uh, I actually uh, did have uh, some code to go through, but I think uh, right now we're running out of time. So what I'll do instead is if there are any questions, uh, we will let you ask them. And uh, uh, whatever you have here will be made available to all of you, and uh, including the code. Uh, so uh, feel Thank free you. to. Yeah. Thank you, guys.